<laughs> okay. Um, all right. Uh, I already introduced myself to most of you, but I think my name is Abby, and uh, I'm a PhD student at University of Southern California in the Department of Earth Science. Um, and Earth Science used to be called Geology, so I, I mostly deal with rocks. Um, uh, but I come from an in, like a ecology, environmental science background, so I'm really interested in water. But uh, to understand water chemistry, um, I ended up looking for um, So uh, we're asked to like tell you a little bit about ourselves. So this is kind of like the making of a scientist um, slide, and and the next one. So I'm from Idaho, um, and a lot of people get confused about Idaho. I don't know where it is. Um, so, um, if you only learn something from this presentation, uh, it's that Idaho is in between Montana and Washington. It's considered the Northwest. Um, but I moved around a lot. I lived um, some in Arizona. I mostly grew up in Washington State. Uh, I lived in Virginia and D.C. Uh, for work and school for a while, and now I... Um, so, obviously, I was doing a lot of different things in these places, and... Uh, I will describe some of the things I've done so you guys can get an idea of like how one becomes a, a scientist or a geologist. Um, so for my undergrad, I studied ecology and I ended up doing work on um, yak herding in China. Um, and that was great, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I ended up working as a wind energy um, a data anal analyst uh, for four years. Um, so my company helped build wind farms like uh, Developers would hire us, and we'd analyze wind data and math data, and we would design the wind farms and tell them where to put the turbines. Um, so that was a great job, but uh, I figured out after a while that I didn't want to be an engineer and I didn't want to be a business person. Um, so I didn't know what I wanted to do. So um, I just quit, and I moved to China to study Chinese. Uh, and I'm sorry for the soft photo, but that's like basically what that year was about. Like, Studying Chinese and eating. <laughs> um, so after a year of that, uh, you know, I needed to get serious about my career, so I, I decided to try environmental science, um, which I hadn't really done professionally. So uh, first I got a job as a biogeochemistry lab, so studying kind of the, the chemistry of the environment, and I worked on lakes, um, and we measured um, chemical processes in lakes and reservoirs. Uh, and I liked that a lot, so um, I applied for a research grant, and I got it to go back to China and um, study mangrove reforestation, so like little tiny seedlings like this. And this is where I really got interested in like mud and sand, because there's a lot of chemistry that goes on in the mud of mangrove forest, and that can end up having like global consequences. So it's not very glamorous, but it like affects the entire climate. Um, so after that, I did a master's and um, I studied oyster farms, again, the mud in oyster farms. So how um, mud under oyster farms can help clean up uh, water pollution or maybe make water pollution worse. Um, so that was really great and I really loved working with um, oyster farmers and kind of you know, an industry that has environmental um, impacts or benefits. And um, so I, you know, I had these, you know, three kind of researchy, you know, water and mud research type things. But science is a lot of work, and it's kind of stressful, so I still wasn't sure I wanted to be a scientist. So um, I moved to Washington, D.C., and I worked for NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, you guys probably know, like, the Weather Service. That's part of NOAA. So I worked for NOAA for a year. And um, does anyone know what that flag is? I would I barely know. So that's the Cuban flag. Um, so I worked mostly on Caribbean and Cuban affairs, um, and it was all like environment, um, ocean policy related. And uh, a fun fact is when we started, the US and Cuba started kind of like warming up under the Obama administration. Um, uh, the first official like agreement between the two countries was with NOAA, um, and it was with uh, marine protected areas. So like cooperating on marine protected areas in Florida and Cuba. Um, so that was neat to see kind of how like uh, science and conservation can be used for diplomacy. Um, so that was a good experience, but uh, not so good that I wanted to stay working with politics <laughs> and policy. You know, I think most of the work I did with Cuba is like not nothing happened with it. You know, like a new administration comes and then everything changes. So um, at least if it was science, like you make progress. You know, you find something out and. Um, 
uh, it's just kind of like a pure uh, pursuit of knowledge that I think ends up benefiting people. Um, so I decided not to do, um, not to work in policy anymore, and I went back to environmental science, and now I'm trying to learn how to be a geologist. Um, okay, so you guys can ask me any questions about this now or later. Yeah. Are those the tufas at uh, Mono Lake? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, I feel like no, like, good California geolo geologist, like, I mean, if you're if you're a California geologist, like you have to have a photo of yourself. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so my current research is about ocean acidification, and um, that is a, it's a it's a big phrase, and I get tired of saying it, so I might say OA, ocean acidification. Um, so I'll, I'll spend a few slides talking about what is OA and how does it happen, because um, it's it's an important concept for my research. Um, so ocean, OA is um, sometimes called the other CO2 pro problem, um, global warming's doppelganger, which is a funny description, um, global warming's forgotten crisis. Um, so it's like the, the ocean side of global warming. Um, and like global warming, it all starts with CO2, carbon dioxide. So um, this plot shows um, the variations in uh, carbon dioxide um, over in the atmosphere over the last 400,000 years. So uh, yes, there's natural variation. Like you know, some people argue that climate change is just a natural, it's just a natural process. So um, yes, it's true. We do see variations in global carbon dioxide over geologic time. Um, but once the once we get to here to modern times, um, the start of the industrial revolution, we just see this huge spike in carbon dioxide. In it. And the last time we were at this level um, above 400 parts per million was um, about uh, more than three million years ago, but best we can tell by looking at the geologic. Um, so it's really like statistically impossible that this is just like a natural spike. Um, you know, there's something that we're doing that's adding all this carbon dioxide. To that. Um, so that's that's the beginning. That's the atmosphere. But um, I'm interested in the ocean. So how does carbon dioxide in the atmosphere get into the ocean? Um, it's just as simple as uh, gases dissolve in water. So you put a bunch of this in the atmosphere, and some of it is going to be pushed into the ocean. Um, and then once it's in the ocean, you get uh, some chemistry happening that the carbon dioxide combines with water, and it forms this um, uh, carbonic acid, uh, which is an acid, so it makes the ocean more acidic. Uh, so if this uh, doesn't make intuitive sense, just think of a soda stream. Um, you know, we basically just put high pressure gas into the um, into the water, and then some of it dissolves into the water, making soda. So you can kind of think of ocean acidification as we're soda streaming the ocean. Um, we're just forcing CO2 into the water. Uh, okay, so um, just to, to prove to you that this is happening, um, this again is a plot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, it, okay. Um, this is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, um, and then we just started realizing ocean is happening about 30 years ago, so we started recording it, and CO2 in the water is doing the same thing. And then this, the blue lines here is um, the pH of the water. So just the, the definition of pH is um, as pH goes down, that's an increase in acidity. So um, more carbon dioxide, um, more acidity, lower pH. It's just the definition of uh, so, uh, you know, this is kind of scary for the ocean, that the ocean's getting more acidic, um, but it's actually kind of good for the climate. So the ocean, because the ocean absorbs all this carbon dioxide, if it weren't absorbing carbon dioxide, we'd have 30% more in the atmosphere. So uh, global warming would be like much more intense if the ocean wasn't like helping us by like sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere. So, um, you know, good for the climate, good for the climate, bad for the ocean. Um, okay, so what are some reasons we should care about ocean acidity? Um, the main thing you'll hear about is um, that it's bad for animals that make their shells out of carbonate. So like corals or oysters or clams, um, carbonate is a, is a mineral that dissolves with acid. So as the ocean gets more acidic, these shells start dissolving. Um, this is a really like kind of famous picture of, um, this is called a pteropod. It's an ocean um, little small ocean um, creature, and um, 
uh, when you soak it in acidic water, it starts to dissolve. Uh, so there's a lot of research on like animals being hurt by ocean acidification. Um, another um, another thing is that acidic water can actually release um, toxic pollution from sediments. So it causes a lot of changes in the ocean. Um, and I am, my, my research is more focused on the chemistry, not the impacts, but this is kind of why, why we care that this is happening. Um, okay, so it's a global problem. It's happening everywhere, but um, is it happening in California? Yes, it is. Um, so um, this is a, from a paper that um, showed um, model results. So this is, you know, relatively recent times. Um, 200 years ago, um, the ocean was uh, less acidic. So if you look at the scale over here, blue is um, less acidic, down to red is more acidic. So um, over the last few hundred years, um, we've been getting more and more acidic. And if you uh, project into the future, we're getting even more acidic, um, especially right along the coast. Um, and so this is the surface water, and then if you look um, down below the surface, down to the bottom of the ocean, um, as you progress in time, um, you see this red area is increasing, and that is a measure of uh, basically how much um, carbonate rocks will dissolve, or carbonate shells, or coral. So as we move forward to 2050, anything that makes its shell out of um, a type of carbonate will have a harder time surviving because the water wants to dissolve it. Um, so by um, 2025, most of the seafloor in California will be permanently um, undersaturated or will be permanently in this kind of dissolution state. Uh, so it's getting worse, and it's especially getting worse um, at, the, at the bottom, like at the seafloor area where a lot of organisms live. Okay, so how do we stop it? Um, on uh, human timescales, I mean, people are looking at like, uh, carbon sequestration, right, uh, and like trying to get all this carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Um, I, I don't have a solution for that. No one does yet. I mean, there are some things proposed, but it's expensive and difficult. Um, but uh, on, on a much longer time scale, like not on our human time, the millions of years time scale, um, the Earth knows how to deal with this, right? Like the Earth has these like feedbacks that kind of, you know, oh, there's too much of this. Okay, we'll, we'll you know, change something to, to regulate it. So the way that the Earth does this um, is through the long-term carbon cycle. So um, I think most of us, like if, if you've studied science at all, when you think about the carbon cycle, you mostly think of like organic carbon. Like, you know, plants take up carbon and soil, and then microbes eat it, and then it goes back into the air. So that's like very short-term, right? All this carbon cycling around. But on a very long time scale, it's really not about the plants. Uh, it's about rocks and um, air and water. Uh, so um, this is a complicated uh, figure, and I, I just want you to focus on two things. Um, first is, uh, there we go. Um, so carbon dioxide goes into the atmosphere naturally by volcanoes or by us burning fossil fuels. Um, it turns into carbonic acid when it reacts with water, and then it um, reacts with rocks. So that's the main thing. Uh, carbonic acid reacts with rocks. And when carbonic acid reacts with rocks, um, the, it, the rocks essentially turn the, the CO2 into bicarbonate, which is harmless. So that's, that's the way that the earth pulls carbon dioxide out of the air. It, uh, rocks are weathered and it turns into bicarbonate. Uh, so uh, it would be cool if we could find a way to speed this up. You know, if we could take advantage of rocks um, to like get CO2 out of the atmosphere. And some people are talking about that as a potential solution for climate change. It's all kind of terrestrial based. Um, this was a, just a very recent paper or very recent publicity of a paper uh, about a certain type of rock in Oman that um, dissolves very easily. So when, when it reacts with water, um, it, it turns the CO2 into bicarbonate. Um, uh, but again, like this is not, no one has like found a way to do this on like a useful scale yet. We just know that this happens in the earth. Um, so my research is focused on sand. Like sand is just a type of rock that's very small, right? So maybe we could uh, think about sands as like a way to weather rock and turn carbon dioxide into bicarbonate. Um, so, uh, and also sands are very common. So sands cover 70% of the continental shelf around the world. Um, so in this uh, map here, 
Um, this, the main pink color is clay, so that's not really sand, but that's in the very deep ocean. But if you look right along like the continents, you know, see this orange area, this is all sand. And this is also the area where like water is kind of like sloshing through sand. So you end up getting this like potential for a lot of chemistry to happen, right? Like water just like flowing through sand. Um, so, oh, here's just like a diagram of, you know, th thinking about conceptually how water is interacting. So, you know, at the very near shore, you get waves crashing into the sand. And then as you move down, um, just water flowing over ripples can like cause the water to go into the sand. And then um, once you get even deeper, just like the waves on top of the water can like cause different pressure on the sand. So, pumping. Um, so um, there's probably a lot of like carbon chemistry going on, but we don't know. Like people aren't really haven't done that much research on it. So that's that's what I'm trying to measure. And the ultimate question is, as as the ocean be get, becomes more acidic, and this acidic water flows through sand. Will we be increasing the rate of this process to like turn use rocks to turn CO2 into bicarbonate? Um, so potentially sands could like buffer acidic water. Um, okay, so how am I answering these questions? Um, the first thing I'm doing is um, I use these things that um, I don't I haven't decided like in my paper I might call them flow through bioreactors because like in science. You want to give things cool names, but it's really just a tube of sand. Um, so I, 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 uh, I have like acidic water in these bags, and then I pump the water up through the bottom of the sand out the top. And then I measure the water, um, you know, as it goes in, and then when it comes out, and then however it changed is because of the sand. Um, and the reason you have to have water in bags like this is because if you have some water open to the atmosphere, it's going to interact with the atmosphere and then it changes the chemistry of the water. So I have to have it in an airtight bag to like maintain the chemistry um, how I want it. Um, so I pump acidic water through um, various uh, beach sands from California and then I measure um, the OA related carbon fluxes. So um, alkalinity is a term that I might use again, um, which is basically um, anything that soaks up acid. So if, if these sands are um, releasing alkalinity, then that soaks up acid. So like bicarbonate is a form of alkalinity. So if rocks, uh, if rocks, if rocks are able to turn carbon dioxide into bicarbonate, um, then they're producing something that soaks up even more acid. Um, OK, so uh, I just started. I'm just a first year student, so I haven't done that much work. But I, I have some data um, that I can just use as an example. So um, this is a complicated plot, but I think that um, it's really helpful, so I'll just explain it quickly. Um, so on this, on the y-axis, this is alkalinity. So like I said, like that's kind of like the good stuff that soaks up acid. And then this is um, dissolved inorganic carbon. And that's you can think of that as mostly carbon dioxide. So that's kind of the bad stuff. So um, if you move up, that's towards the good stuff. You want more. And if you move over, that's like more carbon dioxide. You don't want that. Um, and then this um, this scale here, um, this is basically like the saturation state of a type of carbonate rock. So if you if it's blue, it's very saturated. Then like animals are happy, you know, they're not going to dissolve. But if it's red, if it's red, then um, you know animals start, might start dissolving. So uh, we want to move up. We want to move into the blue area, like you know, ocean health. So um, these uh, dots represent data that I have from my bioreactors. And um, so uh, at the beginning, at the, the inlet water, I'm here, and then I move over here at the outlet. So the sand is making the water more acidic. It's adding more CO2, and it's becoming less saturated. Um, and so that's not very good, right? So like, this is current. This is a, an experiment I did where I didn't add any acid. This is just water that you know got out here. And so basically what's happening is sand makes the water more acidic. You know, there's like microbes in there, they're breathing out carbon dioxide. So that's, it makes sense that um, as water goes through sand, it just becomes slightly more acidic. Um, but then these points down here are water that I acidified to, to um, pretend that it's like future ocean water. So this is, um, you know, California, oh, I think this battery's dying. California beach water in um, 50 years, let's say. And, um, when, when I flow that through sand, they move up more than over. So um, 
they're producing more alkalinity and less CO2, and they're making the water more saturated with carbonate, which is good for animals. So they're essentially um, reducing the acidity. So current conditions, sand makes water more acidic. Future conditions, sand makes water less acidic. <coughs> so there's gonna be some point in the future, I mean, at least based on this very preliminary data, there's some point in the future where we cross the threshold and sand starts actually helping instead of hurting. Um, so more work this summer, um, basically just a lot, a lot of this, a lot of sitting in front of the fridge taking samples. Um, but also um, I'm planning to do additional sand types. So, so far I've done um, uh, sand from Santa Monica um, here, and I've done sand from um, right out front of the labs here, and I'd like to do sand from another rock type. So, you know, the other half of the island would be good. Um, and then I also am planning to do some in situ experiments where I'll take a chamber and I'll put it out in the beach to get a more kind of more natural rate instead of something that I'm doing in a fridge. Um, some related work that uh, my lab is also doing, um, there's this enzyme called carbonic anhydrase um, that can speed up rock dissolution. Um, so animals make this enzyme, it's very common in the environment. and um, I didn't mention before that like dissolving rock is very slow. That's why we haven't been able to like use this natural process for, um, you know, like put it in factories to, to pull carbon dioxide out of the air. Um, it's very slow, but we know that this enzyme can make it happen faster. So we're, we're trying to look at where this enzyme is in the environment and can we relate it to rates of um, rock dissolution. Um, so that's a picture of the enzyme. And then this is our RU Maddie and she's been, um, uh, taking samples from my um, my sand columns and from other places um, around the island to measure how much carbonic anhydrase is there. Um, so where is it and can we relate <coughs> it to um, the, the fluxes of alkalinity uh, that I'm seeing? Um, other areas of, oh, oh wait, that's it, that was the one. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm sorry, I didn't put in a closing slide, um, but uh, this work is funded by, by Wrigley and the uh, Vicki Burdick's um, uh, uh, memorial uh, grant. And um, also um, my lab's work is funded by NSF. So uh, obviously thank you to those two folks. Um, and happy to talk about anything in the presentation. Yeah. Are the processes similar in freshwater? Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. I think our, my lab, so other people in my lab do more of like the hardcore like geology um, chemistry. Like they're actually looking at the kinetics of the process. So they would know that more. Uh, good question. Anything else? Yeah. Um, so the results that you showed. Yeah. Um, those are all, they're all collected from the same place, or those collected out in the code here? Um, no, I think those are actually from different places. I haven't done enough, um, I haven't done enough, uh, well, I, I saw the same pattern, so I think that this one is from Santa Monica, and okay. this one is from the code but I haven't done enough from the cove to have this range of starting values. But I saw the same pattern in Santa Monica, where it's like this happens at the beginning and then as I acidify the water, it, it moves up. So th these were just the prettiest kind of replicate data sets. Um, and it, I mean, it's kind of like, it makes sense like logically, like if you just, if you make water very acidic, then it's going to dissolve things and it's going to, it's going to produce alkalinity. Um, but it's just quantifying that and knowing like at, at what point um, in the natural environment this shift will happen. It hasn't been done and it would be really helpful for like climate modeling. Like this is, um, you know, this is, this is not happening on the scale that it's going to like save the beaches and like, you know, make coastal waters less acidic. Like you have to get very acidic before it starts. Yeah. Do you do, do you do any like filtration or purification of the sand before you run um, samples through it or is it just raw? No, it's, off the beach? I sieve it just okay. to make sure that I get out like crabs mm -hmm. or like rocks, you know, just to make sure that all my 
all my treatments are kind of the same size of, of rocks. Um, but then I don't, it's like live sand. Got all the microbes in it. Yeah, so the patterns we see, like this can be from rock dissolution. Um, you know, when, when we see this um, increase in DIC, that's mostly microbial, right? Because microbes are breathing out carbon dioxide, so it's making the water more acidic. So this is a combination of biological and geological um, results. And I have some, some intention of um, killing the sand. Um, so that there's no biology happening, it's just kind of the G whatever the rock is doing. Um, but I haven't, I haven't figured out all of the methods for that yet. Like playing with mercury is not fun and it causes, produces a lot of waste and, um, and needs to do some more troubleshooting. Just combust it. What's that? Just combust it. Just combust it? I mean, I could, but then I, but then you'd end up. Uh, potentially dissolving a lot of the rocks that you want. Like if you're doing it with like fresh water at high. Uh, based on my In terms of like grain size or? Yeah. Okay. Okay, let's talk about it. That, that would be helpful. <laughs> I, I, but another thing too is like I would have to kill the water too, like because there's still some amount of microbial activity happening in the water. So I probably have to use mercury. Anyway, I can't combust the water. Yeah. How would you kill the sand? How would you kill the sand? OK, so like the suggestion she, she gave was combusting it, which just means like heating it up. You know, if you like bake something, then the life dies in it. Um, another way is poison it. So if you add mercury, then, you know, like we would die if we breathed in a bunch of mercury, right? And so the same is true with like bacteria. So bake it or poison it. Both not very pleasant. <laughs> yeah. So there are models of like how the pH is changing in the ocean and where we're kind of going to be over time. Where is that in a possible time scale? Or is it just like off the charts? The these 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 data here. Yeah. Um. No. These were like. Let me think. Um. This would be on the low end of the 2050 projection. So, um, you know, the values that this paper predicted for 2050, um, you know, there's a range of uncertainty, right? So those those data points would be on the low end of, of 2050. Yeah. Oh, so that's not way off. <laughs> no, it's not way off. Yeah. Um, but, you know, again, something to think about with um, um, any kind of um, data. I mean, this is just like a micro view of like one thing that's happening and like, you know, who knows what happens when in, in, and this is like from, you know, tubes in the fridge, you know, like what happens in the actual environment and once the water interacts with the water column. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of questions to be answered. Like people haven't done that much work on sands. It's a lot easier to work with mud that there's just, you know, like an interface, but with sand, it's like, Water is pumping through at different rates, different times of the day, different times of the year. If you don't know how long, how deep it goes, like even just the physics of water going through sand is. And anyway, so to answer your question, this is like realistic on the low end for 2050. Um, but uh, I mean, I wouldn't just say that this is this is the full picture. Yeah. Is there any plan to like simulate those different flow regimes, like? Instead of collecting, I mean, you could obviously collect sediment from different zones, I guess, as you move deeper, but yeah. you know, maybe have like intermittent yeah, that's, cycling versus that's like. That's a good constant. question. Um, so there are, there are some like method studies that people have done where they, because uh, you can't just have this like open in the environment. You need to contain it, right? So you have to simulate different types of flow. So people have done like different, um, different pressures to, to make the water go deeper. Um, I'm doing something pretty basic. I'm just increasing flow rate. So I'm doing like very slow, medium, and fast. So, um, you know, like fast flush, fast pumping versus kind of slow movement. Um, and I don't, I don't have results from that yet. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of questions to ask. That's, that's one. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for the questions.